All right, everybody, I'm Aaron Caden. I'm a meteorologist with the Weather Service in Newport, Moorhead City. Uh, special thanks to Drew and James uh, at Dare County for setting this all up. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Drew. We're going to jump into his presentation. He's going to go over some Dare County specific information. And then the second half of the talk is going to be me talking about all the impacts of a storm. So Drew, you are ready. Well, I'm, I'm going to start off with welcome everybody that's here with us at the EOC. It's great to have you with us. My theme is get ready because it's that time. We're already in hurricane season. It only takes one. Uh, we're already three down for this year, which uh, last year at this time we were seven down. So maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. I don't know, but it only takes one storm. That's the forecast. And Eric's probably going to talk a little bit more about that than I will because he's the weather professional. And I'm just the guy who takes advantage of the weather professionals to share information. But we're already into the season. Ted, I, I got seven simple things to ask people to do now. Okay, they're, seven, they're simple, I hopefully they're simple. One is determine your risk. I know some of you live in a flood, flood area, you probably know it's at the X zone or the AE zone. That's really not your risk. Everybody lives in a flood zone out here. You could get wet anywhere in this county. You could have damages from wind, you could have damages from rising water, flood water. Uh, the flood zones are for flood insurance purposes. Evacuation zones are where you need to think about how deep is that water you're going to get from storm surge and other hazards. So know what your risk is, and the entire county is at risk. Develop an evacuation plan. I ask this in every presentation I go to, who has an evacuation plan? I get a couple hands coming up. I say, I've got an evacuation plan, because I do. My plan is I come here, my wife gets in the car and goes to Virginia. And that's our plan, because I know I'm going to be here with many of my best friends, and i got a plan to come here, and she's got a plan to go somewhere else. But make sure you have that evacuation plan. Know where you're going to go, know where you're going to stay, and don't rely on a shelter. Okay, I'm going to say that about 10 times in this presentation. Don't rely on a shelter. A shelter is the last place you want to go. The only thing that's good about a shelter is it's safe. That's about it. If you have friends that come and visit in this beautiful county from far away, go visit them during a hurricane. Get out here and go visit with your friends that are not freeloading with you, but coming down to take advantage of the beach when it's nice, and when it's not nice, go visit them. Take the, get that plan. Know where you're going to do with your pets. Do all of those things now. Think about that plan now, so that when the evacuation order is issued, don't be saying, where's the shelter at? Be going, I'm getting in my car, I got my plan, I'm going here. And we're, we're getting past the COVID challenges that we've had, but we still, if you ended up in a shelter, it could be a congregate shelter or non-congregate shelter. You could be in an auditorium in a school or you may be in a hotel. Those things are places you don't want to rely on. They're safe places, but have your plan now and know what you're going to do. As you do that, now's the time to refresh those supply kits. So make sure you have everything you need so that when you get up and go, you've got food for the dogs, food for the pets, the kids, the medicine, all of the things you need, water, things like that. And if you do stay at home, have staying at home, but have it ready to go with you. So when you get in a car to go, you take it with you. There's a lot of good information on readync.org for that tough stuff to help you plan and fill those kits. It's never too late to get an insurance checkup. If you got flood insurance, good. If you don't, think about it. Even if you're in the X zone, think about flood insurance. It's cheaper. It's there. It's available to you. But get it now because it's not effective for about 30 days after you get the policy. So get it now. Do you can check up on your homeowners. Make sure that's all in place. Make sure you got your coverages. Do all the things now so that when you need it, it's not going to fail you. Get your home ready. Uh, help your neighbors. Uh, if you, as you live out here, you start to remember to put the stuff away. The things that are going to fly around the yard, go across the street into their neighbor's yard. Tidy up the yard. Get everything ready. Make sure your your gutters are able to work. All those things you need. If you got shutters, know where they are. Know how you're going to get them up. If you don't have shutters, think about what you're going to do. If you got to protect your home, do that now. And if you got neighbors, help your neighbors. Sometimes we forget about our neighbors, but our neighbors are. Just to, they might need more help than we than they can do themselves. Offer them that help, and I'll talk a little bit more about how to help your neighbors in the, in the future. So, strengthen your home, help your neighbors, know your trusted sources of information. I, I rely on that guy for weather information. That's about it. And then, well, Eric or Dave Glenn or Scott Kennedy, the forecasters down at the, the National Weather or Service Office, more head, or the folks down at the Hurricane Center. Uh, that's who I turn to. I, I don't look at the game miles. I don't look at anything. I look at what they're giving us. But know your trusted sources of information. Hurricane Center, Forecast Office, Ready NC, which is NAP, it puts information out. 
And also, if, you, if you're out here or anywhere, you can sign up for OBX alerts, and I'll show you a little bit about that in the, in the future. Number seven is complete a written hurricane plan. Why is it important to write it down? Because if you don't write it down, when you're under the crunch, you're not going to know what you talked about, where you're going to go. You're not going to know what you told your family you're going to do. But if you take it out and pull it out, it's time to get the kit. Oh, forgot the water. Get the water. We're going to get the car. We're going to go to Raleigh. We're going to do this. Have it written down so when you're under pressure, you have it in front of you being executed. So seven things to do now. We get a lot of questions about emergency decision making out here on the Outer Banks. And Mary, you went through this many a time uh, when you were in office, but we, we put together a video of uh, emergency decision making out here. And on this delicate sandbar, emergencies happen every day and tough decisions need to be made. Most days, those decisions are made by first responders who take action and solve problems quickly using the authority and resources they have at hand. But what happens when an emergency exceeds their capabilities or has the potential to bring widespread impacts to a town or across the entire county? Impacts could come from anywhere, a storm, a man-made disaster, a public health crisis, an act of terror, civil unrest, or a chemical release, just to name a few. When we are facing widespread or severe damage, injury, or loss of life or property? How are decisions made to keep our community safe? In North Carolina, counties and towns operate under authority granted by state statute. For emergencies, North Carolina General Statute 166A, the Emergency Management Act, provides the authority and responsibility that local governments have to prevent, prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergencies. The act defines an emergency as an occurrence or imminent threat of widespread or severe damage, injury or loss of life or property, resulting from any natural or man-made threat or hazard. Counties are responsible for emergency management efforts to include coordinating activities with towns. To meet this responsibility, counties and towns establish emergency management agencies, expend funds to keep people and property safe, implement emergency management plans, provide emergency management response resources, and declare local states of emergency when needed to ensure public health and safety. The county or a town will declare a local state of emergency when they believe an emergency exists or is imminent. In DARE, each town in the county have an emergency management ordinance that designates the authority to declare a state of emergency to the town's mayor, the chair of the board of commissioners, or their designee. While these individuals have the authority to declare a state of emergency, and impose prohibitions and restrictions, they need the best information available to make the best possible decisions to protect public health and safety. When an emergency has occurred or is looming on the horizon, we turn to our emergency operations plan. The plan, required by Chapter 92 of the Dare County Code, provides a framework that brings decision makers, subject matter experts, and others together to share information and coordinate decision making. In the plan, we use the term senior leaders to identify decision makers who have the authority to declare a local state of emergency and impose restrictions and prohibitions. The term is also used to describe others who have authorities they can use independently to protect public health and safety. The National Park Superintendent and the Dare County Sheriff have authorities outside of the Emergency Management Act, making them key senior leaders who routinely collaborate and coordinate actions with the chair of the Dare County Board of Commissioners and our town mayors. When challenges arise and actions are needed to ensure public health and safety, our senior leaders, along with other key personnel, come together. They meet either in person or virtually and receive briefings from subject matter experts on what to expect, ways to mitigate impacts, and how best to protect our community. While we always focus on ensuring public health and safety, we never set aside how actions taken impact business and community activities. Often senior leaders will reach out to key partners and community leaders to gather information and keep them informed as tough decisions are made. Depending on the circumstance, a state of emergency may be declared. While no one wants to impose prohibitions and restrictions, we know that without them, those we serve may be put unnecessarily in harm's way. While each senior leader has independent authority, either from the Emergency Management Act or other statutes that allows them to take actions on their own, they always strive to reach consensus. Once decisions are made, they are captured in a written state of emergency declaration. 
that is quickly communicated to the public and implemented. As the situation changes, decision makers are briefed and if changes are needed, the declaration is updated with prohibitions and restrictions being added or removed. These efforts continue until the emergency no longer threatens public health and safety. When an emergency crosses jurisdictional boundaries or is anticipated to bring widespread impacts to the county, a state of emergency may be signed by the chair of the Board of Commissioners, outlining all decisions and detailing who provided consent. Often towns will issue their own declaration signed by their mayor. At times, a declaration may be issued by just the county or a town. Just like the everyday decisions made by a lifeguard, a law enforcement officer, a firefighter, an emergency medical technician, or a 911 call taker to save lives and protect property, senior leaders are empowered to take action to ensure public health and safety when our community is facing widespread or severe damage, injury, or loss of life or property. These are tough decisions made with the best information available from subject matter experts and key stakeholders that lead to actions that protect our community until emergency conditions are no longer present. For more information, visit www.darenc.com slash emergency management. So that video we put together really to help people understand how decisions are made out here. With that said, I wanted to move on to evacuation zones. Last year, the state implemented uh, evacuation zones across the entire coastal community in North Carolina. We have two of them in, North, in Dare County. We have Zone A, which is all of Hatteras Island, and Zone B, which is the rest of the county. We, we evacuate by zones. We lay it out in verbiage, and we will also say Zone A or Zone B. If you go to the knowyourzonenc.gov website, they have a lookup tool. You can put your address in, and if you're not certain, if you're on Hatteras Island or in Manio, you can put it in there and it'll straighten it out for you. It'll tell you what zone you're in. But it's a really neat tool. But I, I share that. We only have two zones, but a place like New Hanover, if you have family down there, has multiple zones. They might have five zones. And they make it down to the street level and in the downtown area. And it may be one zone on one side of the street and a different zone on the other side of the street. So it's an important tool for everybody who lives in a coastal community or who might be visiting a coastal community across the state. I talked about this before, I put it up again, have a plan. Um, last year when I put this slide together, life-threatening storm surge flooding and high winds take priority. And I was saying that over uh, whether or not you had, to, had COVID challenges. They still needed to go and get away from the hazard here uh, and go somewhere else to be safe. There, you went to somebody else's home, wherever it might be, but it's still just as important to have that plan and be ready to evacuate. Uh, be ready to go when the evacuation's ordered, take that kit. As I said earlier, listen for inland shelters. I'll show you where you can hear those shelters, but don't go to a shelter, have a plan to go somewhere else so you don't end up in either a congregate or non-congregate shelter. And shelters may not even have cots for the first 24 to 48 hours. They may have a, a cold meal for you, but it's not someplace you wanna be. We do have uh, transportation available. So for those folks that may be challenged getting somewhere, either they don't drive or they're here visiting with us and they don't have a car, uh, they, all they have to do is call our EOC number. We have our activity buses and we'll get them to a shelter. But we have the way to do that. So big plans now, don't include a shelter for that evacuation, okay? Did I hit that hard enough? So this is the readync.org page. This is where you can get information on how to put the kits together how you can develop your plans, a lot of great information there. Uh, it's also in a mobile version. So if everything failed, your, your friend said, don't come here, go somewhere else as you're driving halfway across the state, open up the mobile app, you can look for open shelters and it'll give you directions to get to the open shelters. So it's there and available for you. It's also got great information on outages, road conditions, all that information right in the handheld device you may have with you. I'm not going to show this video. Uh, it's a little bit older, but it talks about how to sign up for a special medical needs registry. <clears throat> People can go to that site there and, and do that. Um, so this is if you have a neighbor who might need some help, or if you want to get on the special medical needs registry, if you know somebody who has a medical condition or may need a help from one of our emergency medical services technicians to help you get somewhere. People can sign up. Katie McCarran, our social services, adult services director runs that program. And I, I tell you, uh, usually we're talking to Eric early and Katie's talking to her people who are in the social medical registry really early. 
just calling them saying, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Do you need help? So if you have people on uh, oxygen, on other medical needs, she's taking care of that. We're getting ahead of that. And if we're trying to get them to someplace where they can be cared for by family, or in the worst case, that we get them to a state medical shelter somewhere inland. But we have a great team that allows us to take care of the people that need a little extra hand out here. All right, getting official information. I talked about this a little bit earlier. I, who signed up for OBX alerts? Oops, oh, it's great. Now, if you're getting ones you don't want, because you, we, we got a lot of opportunities there. If you live in Manio and you don't want the duck alerts, you got to go back into your profile and deselect those. But if you're getting the ones you want, that's good. Uh, we have one that's Dare County Emergency Alerts. That's the one where we will send out large pieces of information about evacuations using OBX alerts. Um, there's a short video. I, I'm not going to play that either, uh, but it will describe how to do it. It's on our website, how to sign up. And I have to talk about the integrated public alert and warning system. On your phone, there's government alerts if you have a mobile phone. If you don't have the government alerts turned on, you're not going to get the tornado warning that Eric sends. It's not going to come across on your phone. You're not going to get the evacuation order that we send using iPaws. So you have to have the emergency government alerts turned on your phone. I know how to do it on an Apple phone. I don't know how to do it on an Android, but it's it's simple to do. And, and you'll know they're on because when a, a tornado warning goes out, a severe thunderstorm warning, a lot of different warnings that they send out, your phone's going to go, oh, and it's going to say weather warning, or it's going to say public safety alert, and it's going to come up. And the only ones you can't turn off are the presidential alerts. You, you can't turn those off, but so make sure your, yours are on. And if, I, I got to talk about ocean hazards. Any, any place I get an opportunity to talk about ocean hazards. We have them out here in Dare County. We lose too many people in the ocean, whether it's through a rip current or just a longshore current or shore break. We do have a system where we can push information to people. You can, if you got visitors coming in, they send a text. OBX beach conditions is 77295. You can sign up for it on your profile as well. You'll get a couple of email or text messages every day about the beach conditions. And uh, we got to push the weather service forecast into the hands of people before they go over to Dune so they can make the right decision about what they're going to do at the beach today. So I talked about that twice today now, right? Eric, Eric and I were on a webinar with the National NOAA today talking about the exact same thing on a broader audience. But I showed this slide to we got a lot of people. What does above ground mean and how deep will it get? In our state, the state has the North Carolina Flood Inundation Mapping and Alert Network. Five minute. It's called FindmanNC.gov. The flood gauges all around the state. We got about seven or eight of them out here in Dare County. We're getting ready to install some more. And what they do is they tell you when the water's coming up and when it's going down. So on this uh, example, the top picture is during Dorian at the Fesden Center, and that's when the wind was pushing the water out of the sound. You can see it drop, and that's what the, the canal looked like. You can see how quickly it rose. Uh, and you know our good friends on on Ocracoke really took it hard from that. We took it hard in Deer County as well. But you can see how quickly it rose. And if you could start to see it coming up, and you still have internet connectivity connectivity at your house, and you're seeing it come up in your backyard, you might want to start heading upstairs. You might want to start heading higher ground in the home because it might get deep and wet in your house. So Feynman's a great tool, and we're we're getting uh, more gauges installed in Deer County over this next couple of months here. We started installing these poles around the county. This one's down at our Rodanti Beach access. You may see there's one, one or two of them up in Southern Shores. All the towns have two of them. We're starting to get them down on Hatteras Island. It's a simple display of how deep it will get. If you, if you know somebody who lived on Bay Drive when the winds blew during Michael and they had their cars parked in their front of their house and it got to three feet, four feet above ground and their car was full of water, we got to ask the question, how deep is four feet above ground? That tells you. Four feet above ground is about halfway up the yellow portion of that bolt. And it tells you that's how deep it's going to get. So if you're worried about it getting into your house or into your car, that's that's a simple way of telling you what it's going to do. And we got a little display there that shares that information as well and, and gives information about the products that the Hurricane Center puts out on flood inundation uh, storm surge map. These two videos, uh, I'm going to play these. Uh, the one from Tom first, irregardless of the sound, if you can hear it out in the virtual world, you'll, you can still see what took place with Tom. This is uh, down on the Florida coast during Mike, Michael, I believe, when Michael came ashore down there. 
And it just should hit that one from Tom first. It's a short video. You can't realize what your house is like when it starts flooding. Everything floats. You can't get down the hallway. I mean, you, you, you got to fight to get where you're going. The door was flexing. We had to hold it. I don't know how long we held it. I don't know how high this water's gonna go. But we're gonna be trapped like rats in here. I saw death outside that door. The guy Tom, you could hear the inflection in his voice when he's talking about he saw death in this door, not knowing how high the water was going to get. So Tom obviously stayed uh, where he was. Now the next one is by Debbie. And let's uh, play that one real quick, Eric. When the word came out that there was mandatory evacuation, we evacuated. We might not be here if we hadn't. I just feel numb. I don't think I processed it yet. Debbie was in a pretty brand new home down there in Florida. She evacuated. I think the storm surge values in that part of uh, Florida were nine to 13 feet. We haven't seen that here, and I hope we never see that here. But guess who did see it in this part of North Carolina? Not too long ago. I believe the city of New Bern, Eric, saw nine to 13 feet of storm surge. To Florence. Florence. And the only reason we didn't see it was Florence decided to go to New Bern rather than mm -hmm. continuing to Dare County. It was forecast to be that high here. So I, I'm hoping we would never see it, but it is a possibility. So um, I spent the last uh, year and a half in this room with Sheila Davies, our health director, not all the time, but she was here running our, our, our response. And I, whenever I uh, get an opportunity, I, I got to encourage everybody to get the shot. Uh, in Dare County, uh, this is as of the 20th of June, we got 58% uh, of our population done. We need to get higher. So if you have friends or hesitancy, please reconsider it. 61% uh, uh, have got the first shot. We want to keep that going forward. And I leave that with uh, three main themes, storm surge, run from the water, hide from the wind, know before you go to the beach, and know how to get information up there. So with that, I'm going to give Eric this clicker, and I'm not going to click anything. And Eric's going <laughs> to give you some really great information about the, what the Weather Service does. And in that video, we did see about uh, our decision making, you saw Scott Kennedy, he was uh, in a blue shirt. He was uh, one of Eric's peers down at, uh, he's a peer or one of his great forecasters down at Newport Moorhead City. He was here in EOC with us, Roll of Dorian. He came up, instead of us doing it virtually, we had a deployed forecaster here and that really helps us uh, with it. So we have great support. And now that Eric's got his presentation up, I know he's gonna um, knock you out of the park with his <laughs> weather talk. All right, Drew. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us. So I am Eric Hayden. I'm the morning coordination meteorologist for the local office down in Moorhead City. Fancy term for the liaison between the weather service and the local community. So all things outreach from education to public safety, anything weather related. Um, I do that out of the local office down in Moorhead City. So we do cover eastern North Carolina. So the area shaded in yellow or highlighted in yellow is our forecast area. So roughly the eastern quarter of North Carolina. So it certainly includes the Outer Banks. We go as far inland as Williamston and Greenville and down through the Crystal Coast. Um, other parts of the state are covered by other offices. So we didn't forget Central North Carolina, that's the Raleigh office. The Wakefield or the um, Richmond office covers Northeast uh, North Carolina. So that's Currituck County northward. And then Wilmington covers the Southeast part of the state. We are there 24 seven. This whole last year and a half, some of us were at home, some of us were at work but we were always open 24 seven. You say, yes, the hurricane last year, we ramp up staff. So uh, on an overnight shift, on a weekend during COVID, that we might have limited staffing, but we ramp up when the weather happens. That dictates what we do uh, down at that office. And that goes true for all weather service offices. Our mission is the protection of life and property. 
very, very passionate men and women in the weather service that work long hours because we care about our community. So remember that when you're thinking about forecasts and you know trusting people, we're doing the best we can and we're certainly putting in the effort. Uh, we're just uh, down at that local office. This is from Florence, I'm pretty sure. Um, this is most of our staff uh, during that, that event. Like I said, we, we cover 24 seven. When there's just regular weather going on, our normal schedule are uh, three shifts, a day shift, uh, which is like seven to four, an evening shift, which is two to 11. That used to be my favorite shift before I had kids because I could sleep in until mid morning. I don't know what sleeping in is, uh, is anymore. Um, and then the overnight shift is my least favorite shift um, because it's you get in at 10 or 11 and you get off at seven or eight in the morning. So much like first responders, police and fire, Weather doesn't happen nine to two, you get every holiday off, uh, despite us working for the federal government. Um, the weather happens whenever it's gonna happen. So we're staffed for those emergencies. Our website is crucial for you to remember. Uh, Drew had it, uh, he showed that sign um, for the storm surge, how, you know, what, what the relation of the height is. If you just remember weather.gov, you don't need HTTP, www, weather.gov. And then you click on your area of interest. So for us, it's Eastern North Carolina. This is the local map. Um, you can get as in depth as you want. My recommendation is to enter your city or zip code in the upper left or to click on the map. It's hard to click on the map on the Outer Banks because we don't have a lot of land area. So enter your city or zip code, Banio, Kill Devil Hills, Hatteras Island, get, get your forecast in the general ballpark, and then you can zoom in on the Google map and get even more specific. Uh, and then bookmark that. That will be your seven-day forecast. Again, the men and women down at the Newport office, every three hours, we're updating that information. I often get questions. What about the European model? What about the GFS model? We're looking at all of it. We want the right model. We don't care which one it is. And a lot of times that's called a consensus forecast where we average things out. So again, website, really, really good information uh, from hazards to local information. Social media can be a good thing especially spreading information when it's accurate. So we rely on people to follow us on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and now Instagram. We use social media to wave our hands and say, this is what you need to pay attention to. Our website is good. There's a lot of information on it. Our social media channel will wave our hands and say, this is what you need to pay attention to. So the example from Florence, uh, the upper left, I did that tweet. I was at the office along with a lot of staff. I was getting the calls saying, hey, it's only a category one now. Can we not worry about it? Can people come back home? No, 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 no. We're gonna talk about the category in a second. We wanted people to you know, be reminded that impacts have not changed. Do not let your guard down. Uh, catastrophic flooding. Category of the storm is only related to wind. You're gonna hear that again and again and again. So that's where we use uh, social media. We send Drew and James and the crew at Dare County and Caratuck all over, you know, for the Wakefield office briefings. We record the part that we present on YouTube. We're in a quick society now. If you have 30 seconds, then that's not for you. If you have five to 10 minutes and you want to know everything that we think is going to happen with this storm, that's on YouTube. And I know they've rebroadcast it as well locally. So best way to find it, NWS Moorhead City. Uh, and a lot of those, including Twitter and Facebook, you can still access even if you're not uh, logged on. You can still see that information. So it's not something that you don't have to jump onto social media just to be a part of it. So weather.gov and NWS Moorhead City, pretty much anywhere on social media, you'll be able to find us. So the time to prepare is now for hurricane season. Hurricane season officially starts June 1st. Here in eastern North Carolina, we've had storms as early as May and as late as October into November. The last couple storms we've had, Arthur, last year was May. So again, usually early in the season, they're not going to be that strong because the water hasn't warmed up, but it still can happen. This graphic is awesome. It shows when the peak is about the middle part of September. The uh, orange or darker red color are hurricanes and tropical storms, and the yellow are just hurricanes. You can see it ramps up. Um, into August, especially in the middle part of September, then it comes down. And that's because hurricanes and tropical systems rely on warm water, and that's when the peak ocean temperatures occur. Uh, so the big point of this slide is we can get storms as early as May, um, but you know, traditionally our peak of the season is in, uh, in September. I will never 
ever, ever forget these, this statement. I'm a kid that grew up in Maryland. I love the snow. I went to school in upstate New York, but I've been here the last four years. So I've experienced a lot. And I'll never forget the year Florence happened. I know it wasn't as big of an impact up here, but somebody said, wow, it's late August. It looks like we're gonna get through this year unscathed. No, don't say that. Because again, late August, we're not even to the peak yet. So a lot of you are nodding your head. You know this information. We have a lot of new folks moving to our area. Share that with them. It's second nature to you, but it's not to somebody that has moved down from the north and thinks, hey, we got through August. We should be fine, right? Just to back it up, Hermine, Irene, Matthew, again, Matthew and Sandy getting late in the season. Uh, so we have a long season, May through November. Now is the time to prepare. The reason why we say that is storms can uh, occur already, what they have done. Uh, Drew um, mentioned some websites at the local level. For our office, if you go to our webpage uh, and you type in hurricane prep, just add that to it. This is modeled after the, the hurricane awareness week. So a lot of things to consider, um, you know, your hurricane kit, what, what to prepare for, food, water, and medicine, at least a week. It may be hard for you financially to get all this in one shot. It may be a lot to grasp. So this is why this weekend you grab a couple can items and next weekend you grab a case of water because what's going to be out when the storm first hits? Water, right? And it's hard to wrap your head around getting it all at once. And again, financially, it might be hard. So get a little bit each week and then you're set. And then if you're like me with young kids or just family, then December and January, you eat some of that hurricane kit, especially if it's some goodies and then you replenish it next year. But again, slow steps, do it now. You don't wanna wait until the storm's here because a lot of places are gonna be out of those, um, those goods and items. So weather.gov, Moorhead City for the forecast, uh, the prep page, but also weather briefings. Uh, if you scroll down the page a little bit, at the very bottom, there's a whole bunch of icons, um, the rivers and lakes, current weather, but there's one called hazard weather, or weather hazard briefing. These are not usually updated if there's quiet weather. So we should have taken the one down from Claudette because everything's over with that. Big severe weather outbreak, winter storm, nor'easter. There'll be a small PDF with slides on what we expect with the upcoming weather. So if it's a sunny weekend, you're not gonna see this updated, um, but that is information for you. I mentioned that our, our mission is protection of life and property. We want you to have this information. We want you to share it. And you have paid for it. We fall under the Department of Commerce, NOAA Weather Service. We're funded by the taxpayers. So we want you uh, to have this information to get that word out. So. Big thing of that, weather.gov slash Moorhead City. Next couple slides, we're gonna talk about um, hurricane forecasting. Why should you listen to us? So, you know, meteorologists, it's the only job you can have and get it wrong all the time, right? I've heard that joke. I was in TV before, so I heard that all the time. Uh, must, be paid, um, be, must be nice to get paid to be right. I'm not a huge baseball fan, but remember the Hall of Famers only get it right about a third of the time for hitting. So just, just remember that. But back to the forecast. How many have seen uh, that graphic on the left, the one with all the lines? Maybe not the spaghetti, but uh, the hurricane um, uh, tracking, you know, spaghetti models. That is a plot of all the different tracks that could happen with this particular storm. I don't, I don't know if this was Florence or not. They have utility in the lower right hand of that graphic where it's all clustered together. That means high confidence. They're all saying the same thing. Anybody could say where it was going at that point. Then farther down the line toward the coast, it could be anywhere from Florida to doesn't even hit the United States. Low confidence, because the spread is wide. It has utility, it makes sense. But when people are sharing it on social media and you live in Florida, which one are you looking at? That, that one that hits Florida. And when you're on the Outer Banks, which one are you looking at? The one that's hitting by us. <laughs> if you have a beach vacation for the next week, which one are you rooting for? The one out to sea. So those don't have a lot of utility in terms of you know, what is actually gonna be happening. We look at all of that at the local level, but especially the Hurricane Center. Over 175 years of experience, the one you should be paying attention to is the one on the right, the one that they're showing on the local news, the one that we put on social media, the one that is from the Hurricane Center. Does it mean it's, the, it's right all the time? No. Is it the best forecast? A thousand percent yes. So please remember that 
Uh, and you can do your part. When you see something on social media, don't share 10 days from now, we're gonna get a storm. That, that, that doesn't help stick to the official uh, information. So, well, of course you're gonna say that, Eric. You drove up from Moorhead City, would you say that something else is better? No. So we're gonna show some statistics. How far have we come since 1999 and Floyd versus Dorian? So this graphic shows our average three-day error for a, um, per, a tropical system. So 1999, you know, I was a uh, second year in college, but if I was working with Drew, I would tell Drew in 1999, the storm could hit somewhere from Southeast Virginia through the Carolinas down to Eastern Georgia. That would be the average error back in 1999 for the center of the storm itself. In 2019, the year Dorian hit, our error was down to roughly the Wilmington area or Southeast North Carolina. So the track forecasting has improved immensely. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some other examples of that coming up. These are new updated graphics. Again, the most popular question I get next to, do you have a weather app, is something about the European model or the Canadian model, or a lot of people are very weather savvy, which is good, it's very, very good. But we want everybody to know that we look at all of it, and that's where a human element comes in and it makes an improvement. So this is the craziest graphic I'll show you. On the bottom is how consistent the forecast is. You can be accurate 12 hours out, but if you're wish washing, it's gonna hit the Outer Banks, it's gonna miss us, it's gonna hit us, it's gonna miss us. That doesn't help Drew at all. A consistent forecast is just as important as an accurate one. So on the bottom is consistency. Toward the left is more um, um, uh, low error and consistent. To the right is inconsistent. On the far left is track error. You wanna be consistent, but you also don't wanna be consistently wrong. So you wanna be right <laughs> as well. So the lower left of the graphic is the best you wanna be. The least, um, the most consistent, more consistent and less error. NHC stands for the National Hurricane Center. And then as you go to the upper right, that's more um, uh, inconsistent and more error. Uh, you can see the different models, the European, UK, MET, and GFS. They have utility, they can help, but the human element is very important uh, because again, a model is, is binary. It's gonna do this or this or this or this. And then we say, hey, okay, we see that trend. Let's inch it a little bit this way. Let's continue that trend. Let's not do the windshield wiper effect and go back and forth. One thing I do want you to remember, um, a couple of things I'm highlighting in this new presentation from the Hurricane Center, we've gotten better with the track force forecasting. That, that's great. But we're getting so precise now, we don't want people to, um, to let their guard down because while the science is improving, just a 10 mile jog this way or that way means all the difference in the world. We've heard it going back to Irene. Well, I never got those values you, you said it was gonna happen. That's good for you, but this person, did get it. So just because it didn't happen to you doesn't mean it can't happen down the road. There, no two storms are alike. And little wiggles matter. This is another very good graphic if I explain it well. This is with Hurricane Laura last year. The dark magenta line, just focus on that one. That is the actual track of Laura. The line to the left, the dotted one with blue, is if it had changed 20 miles farther west. I love sports. They're always saying it's a game of inches, whether it's a game of miles. 20 miles is nothing. With our cur curvature on the Outer Banks, that's a huge difference where it's gonna hit. So you can grasp that 20 miles makes a big difference. So based on the track, if it changed 20 miles to the left or to the right, you can see some of those areas uh, in the pink and to the red, which is just in between, between the two tracks, but it would be to the right of the projection. Uh, five to 10 feet higher, and that red, just to the right of the dotted line, again, if it had changed by 20 miles, 10 to, feet, 10 to 15 feet higher than storm surge. So a huge, huge deal. So little wiggles can happen. We take that into account when we're briefing Drew. Um, you know, when we show, we're gonna show the storm surge graphic, that's a reasonable worst case scenario. It's a 10% chance. We hope most of you don't see that. But when you come back safe from where you evacuated from and nothing happened, that's a, that's a good thing. But we're preparing for the worst case, that it changes, it wobbles. It can still be an accurate forecast, but if it changes by five miles, we do not want you to be caught off guard. 
a couple products, and then we're going to wrap up with impacts, all the impacts that can occur with a tropical system. You might say, well, I came all the way to this class. I know what all the impacts are. You might be surprised by some of the ones that can occur and which ones actually kill more people uh, than others. So uh, another website to remember, uh, weather.gov slash Moorhead City or just hurricanes.gov. We got an S on there. Hopefully that doesn't mean we're going to see multiple hurricanes this year. But that goes to the Hurricane Center website. Or if you just want to save our, our website, if you scroll to the bottom and click on tropical or add the word tropical, uh, that will our local page has all the Hurricane Center products too. So however you want to do it. Um, we've got all their stuff as well. We're, we're, we're all together. The Tropical Weather Outlook, um, just a show of hands, I'm kind of curious, and you can comment uh, at home, how many have seen this before? Not the track map, so, so good. So, so some people have it, and some people have. This is issued four times a day, uh, 2, 2 a.m. and p.m., and um, 8 and 8, a.m. and 8 p.m. And this is what's gonna happen over the next five days, areas of interest before it might have a name, before it's on the, the uh, national news, hey, you know, low, medium, high chance of something developing. So with Claudette, you know, before it was a name, I think it got up to 80 or 90% chance of something in the Gulf. So that's very, very good. A show of hands, have ever, uh, if you've ever seen this map? Yes, so unless you're up in Canada or somewhere that doesn't get hurricanes, you've probably seen this. This is our forecast cone. I mentioned that um, the track has become very, very accurate, so it has actually shrunk over the years. It's not based on the current storm, um, it's based on statistical analysis. So it's really narrow the next day or two because we should know in the next day or two where something's gonna hit. And by day five, it expands. When it does a little circle at the end like that, that means it could go anywhere. It's, 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 there's not a lot of steering currents and it's kind of stationary. This is Florence. A couple important things to point out. Number one, this only shows where the most probable path for the center of the storm will go. It doesn't say who's gonna be impacted and who will not be impacted. For example, in the lower right, during this time frame, that is the wind field, the tropical storm wind field in orange, and the darker shade is hurricane force winds. Notice that goes beyond the path. So again, it just shows you where we think the center of the storm will go. I was talking to Drew this morning. I know Claudette wasn't a, a big deal for uh, pretty much everybody, which is good. It was spinning up by Columbia when we were talking this morning. And I was talking to my kids about how it was a great example of the center was past us. We were done. And we were still quite windy down in Moorhead City. Impacts occur well away from the center. So it's a, not a, hey, I'm in it. I should be concerned. I'm out of it. I don't have to worry about it. If you're anywhere in the general vicinity of this, uh, you should be paying attention. Couple other graphics to go through. Uh, earliest time of arrival. Uh, we use these in the briefings a lot for uh, you know emergency managers, but it, it's good to know. Uh, this map shows when the earliest uh, that the tropical storm force winds could arrive. Uh, so this is a reasonable worst case scenario. So on this graphic, we would say if you've got your evacu well, evacuation plans complete, you've got things tidied up in the yard by Wednesday evening, you should be good to go. That's a reasonable worst case. Hey, when, I ha when do I have to get everything done by? For me, working long days, that's working, 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 and then going home and, and protecting my roses or messing with the garden and getting everything set. Uh, so this is a drop dead, I've gotta, I've gotta be out or I've gotta complete my plans by this time. And then the most likely is when we think it's actually gonna happen. Um, and that is when we think the onset of the tropical storm force winds will occur. Uh, this is from, I think, Arthur last year. I just wanted to show a, um, a more, you know, a newer one. And we would say something like, and this one for the Outer Banks, sometime Monday morning, the most likely time for those tropical storm force winds. Those graphics are on our website, the Hurricane Center site. So they're out there. And if you see them, just kind of want to make you aware of what they are. Eric, uh, yes. tropical storm force wind arrival time is a key, key time for us. We endeavor to have our evacuations complete before the arrival of tropical storm force winds because we want people to be on their way to someplace safe before those 39 mile per hour winds are here especially if they're coming off Hatteras Island trying to get across the bridge or trying to get across the sound we, those are key and I don't think it's just in their account I think most most emergency managers endeavor to be evacuation complete before the arrival of tropical storm force winds 
So the good old Stafford Simpson scale. So we, we use this all the time. We talk a lot about this. A show of hands, if you thought this or heard this, I'm not gonna leave unless it's a three. I'm, I'm not gonna leave unless it's a two, right? I've been through ones and twos before, but threes, I'm out of here. Four, I'm definitely out of here. The category scale is only related to wind. It's to be respected. We had a category four storm. I'm not saying, oh, just ignore it. We gotta talk about the other impacts. It is not your sole basis for your decisions. It is only about the wind. Uh, so please remember that. It doesn't tell us that the storm is gonna sit over us for three or four days. It doesn't tell us that it's a large storm. It doesn't tell us that it's hitting to our left, so we're on the right side of the storm. It says nothing about that. It only talks about the wind, so please, please remember that. Instead of focusing on the category, focus on the impacts. 2010 to 2019, we had a lot of just category ones, right? Just, just a category one, I shouldn't worry about it. 175 people died directly because of that and over $100 billion in damage. Did, do you remember Irene? That was just the one. Uh, up here, her memes, just a tropical storm. Matthew, mm. just the one. Do you remember those names? Dorian, especially Hatteras Island and Ocracoke. Uh, Florence, especially down our way, not you as much. So focus on the impacts, not the category. If you remember Drew's site he mentioned, weather.gov, and this, we're, we're happy. That's a steak dinner for me. We're, we're good to go. Very, very good. So because of that, let's talk about the impacts. We ordered this on purpose, rainfall, flooding, storm surge, and rip currents. For here, I should have probably switched around to rip currents, number one. We'll talk about that in a second. Wind toward the bottom and tornadoes. So why, why did I order it like that? What, why do you think I might have put wind so far at the bottom? What, of all those, what do you think kills the most people in a tropical cyclone? Flooding. The water. Water. So you, you all can teach this class. It's the water is what kills. Like to back it up with statistics. This is an older um, graphic. It's uh, 63 to 2012. About 90% of deaths during that time frame were water. A lot was storm surge. We've made really good improvements with that. But about a third rain, about a half storm surge. If you squint, even with my uh, eyesight, less than 10% wind. Well, Eric, you know, we're 2021. What, what about recently? Recently still backs up those statistics. On the left, 2016 to 2018, 83% water related. Uh, most was inland flooding. Uh, we've made a lot of improvements with storm surge. Only 4% were storm surge related. We'll talk about some reasons for that. Where you can help us with the water, listening to the local officials on evacuation orders, especially with your vulnerability to surge and water and not crossing flooded roads. More than half occur in vehicles. So don't go around the barricades, don't try to cross a road that you think you can make it through, the road could be washed out, it could be deeper than you think. 2020, last year, 47 direct fatalities. Uh, if you add up the surf, rip, Freshwater flooding, seven of them were for uh, uh, Western North Carolina. A couple marine and storm surge, 31 of the 47 were water related. So it's water, 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 uh, not, not the wind. Florence was not a big deal here uh, as it could have been. Uh, Drew did an excellent video in Dare County of just, just a small shift. Again, it would have been your storm. Instead, it was ours down there. And I wanna show you that it's the messaging, and we need your help. It's the messaging we need to improve, not the science as much. We're, we're, our, we are a science-based organization, so we will continue to improve the science. But look at the forecast on the left. The pink shading uh, and the darker purple, uh, I know for some folks, the, the graphic I just noticed, the legend is a little blurry, that's 20 to 30 inches of rain. That was the forecast. On the right is what happened. This squiggly little line is the track. I think the air was like five miles at, at five days out. The track forecast was good, but the, the, the rain forecast was excellent. So, hey, 20 to 30 inches of rain, great messaging, but was it great? We had 17 people die and 16 were in vehicles. So our big campaign with that is please turn around, don't drown, don't cross flooded uh, roads. Let's see uh, if I can get this. You don't need the audio as much on this. Drew mentioned, and it was actually uh, up to 13 feet, like he said. Uh, in Newburn. This is Oprah Cove. 
he showed you the rapid rate of rise on the gauge. It's just hard to just contemplate like how fast that water can rise where it gets pushed on the Pamlico Sound one way and it comes back. Four to seven feet in Ocracoke from Dorian, um, flooding on Hatteras Island as well. Storm surge, the biggest issue with that is it comes up very, very fast. Those two videos he showed are extremely powerful. Uh, not only is water powerful, but hearing um, the, I think it's the man and also the lady talk about their you know, uh, decision to evacuate and then one gentleman that stayed, uh, how it's just, it can be very devastating. So many years ago, we tested this and this is now, uh, it's been many years since this has been operational. On the left is a storm surge watch, on the right is a warning. That's for um, surge three feet or greater above normally dry ground. What is that? Drew mentioned the, the poles that can help. It's low lying areas near the sound, near bodies of water that are usually dry. And that's two, three, four feet, you know, above um, that is what it means. It's hard to explain, but that's what it is. Uh, surge, and those are ones that will come up on your map. Uh, this is from Florence down our way from New Bern. The Neuse River funnels up toward New Bern. Um, this is the potential worst case scenario. This is what um, emergency managers look at when they, you know, as part of their decision making. You can look at this online as well. You can't zoom into your street, but you'll get a general idea uh, for what can be expected. Uh, and this is a reasonable worst case scenario with a 10% chance. Um, not everywhere will see that, um, <clears throat> but that's, that's a possibility. Um, for that to happen. Last year it was a test, it's another, another test again. Um, this has been useful, especially social media wise and some of our briefings, kind of just a bigger picture. Uh, this I think from Isaias, um, and this is just the storm surge graphic on like a, a wider scale uh, for dissemination so that we can tell people what to expect. So you might see that as well. So talked about storm surge. Next I wanna talk about rip currents. Um, we had 19 direct fatalities um, in Lorenzo for water related, and we had eight deaths up and down the East Coast due to Lorenzo because of rip currents, four in North Carolina alone. The storm in Lorenzo, it never hit here. It certainly didn't. It was 2,000 miles away. Nice weekend. I think it was October. Uh, water still warm. Long period swell. It doesn't look ominous. You know, it's not a, a thunderstorm type of day. Hey, I'm not going to go to the beach. To just making people aware of the dangers of rip currents um, from distant tropical cyclones or ahead of tropical uh, systems themselves. We put that messaging into those briefings. Uh, so in a lot of the briefings, we've added this. And again, you might say, who's swimming during a hurricane or a tropical system? Other than the surfers trying to catch the big waves, it's the family that has one more day of vacation and the storm's not gonna hit here until Sunday and it's not raining and they've, they've traveled down from Ohio and they're gonna get one more day in. And it, again, it doesn't look ominous. It's a long period swell that has a lot of energy and we want that message to get out. That is another possibility uh, from tropical cyclones. Just general beach safety, Drew mentioned this before, so I won't hit on it too much. Uh, the biggest thing with us is trying to swim at a lifeguarded beach. I've got younger kids. That's why we're paying down at Emerald Isle to swim right in front of the lifeguard. We're not far away at an isolated part of the beach where there's not a lot of people. Uh, pay attention to the signs and flags. If you swim at a lifeguarded beach, talk to them. They will tell you where to swim, what's going on, uh, things of that nature. Uh, don't become a victim by trying to help someone else. Call 911, get help from a lifeguard, throw them a flotation device, and um, you know, call for help, don't, don't go out there. I know it's very, very hard not to try to help someone. Uh, for sure. And everyone really should have adult supervision. I'm a safety person. I got to practice what I preach. So I was telling my kids, you know, we're in the water. I'm there with them. I said, that, that even goes for dad. I shouldn't just, I can swim, but I should have somebody else in the water for me. Not just rip currents, but what if I have a medical emergency? Think in pairs in, in terms of the water uh, for people to help call uh, the lifeguard or 911 for help. The messaging we've tried to improve as much as we can. Uh, these um, we have new graphics where it looks crazy with all those beaches, but you you know the area. But people only know that I go to Kill Devil Hills. They don't know what who Buxton is or Frisco or or what have you, unless that's the beach they go to. You know, you, you live here, you know them. So we try to put on there as much as possible. Um, and then we've worked with inland offices. I think this is an example from. This is last year, so just a, 
it was a high risk day and I think there was good weather coming up. So something that we shared with inland offices to, uh, to uh, share with others. So storm surge, talk about rainfall, flooding, rip currents. Toward the bottom is wind. On the graphic Drew showed, um, run from the water, because again, that's, a, that's, a, that's the top killer, hide from the wind. Uh, so yes, you can have disruption of power communications, uh, block uh, evacuation routes. This is my neighborhood uh, during Florence uh, and some of the wind gusts that we had. But I want to kind of compare and contrast it to hit the, the category uh, scale again. Uh, show of hands if you remember Arthur. Some of us. So we were certainly impacted. So this is a category two storm, uh, similar landfall by Cape Lookout, Beaufort, so to our south and west. So we were on the right side of the storm. Uh, certainly had hurricane force winds for all of the outer banks. And we did have storm surge on Hatterson and I think in Manio as well. Uh, so impactful, a smaller storm, uh, fast moving, but it was a category two, right? How many of you remember Irene? So a little, little more, more impactful, but it was just a one. However, it was a similar landfall. It's no trick. Oh, Eric, it hit somewhere else. No, not the same spot. Very, very large storm, slower moving storm. So we had more impacts uh, in our whole area, including Dare County from a category one storm. Just to reemphasize, don't just focus on the impacts um, you know, or what the category scale is. And thinking back to Dorian last year, it also depends on where it goes and, and the track on what's gonna happen with the sound. How's the water gonna come back this way? And it, it's very track dependent and intensity dependent. And that doesn't show up in the cat one, two or three. So thinking about the impacts, with Dorian, when we said four to seven feet, a lot of people were still surprised that it came up that fast and it happened. Uh, so please focus on the impacts and don't just say, hey, it's just a one. And don't say it's never happened before because unfortunately that's that's the new records. You know, things think not every storm is the same. Uh, tracks, intensity, location, um, all varies and the impact will vary as well. The tornado threat on here, I've got a more recent one for Dorian, but you certainly had this with Hermine. Um, any tropical system can produce tornadoes, not just hurricanes. We saw that here with Tropical Storm Hermine. The reason why I wanna mention this is they can often occur well away from the center itself, and that means the early rain bands. So although a Florence might miss you, the center, hurricane is not just a dot. Just because it hit down by Wrightsville Beach doesn't mean everybody else is safe. You, if you're impacted by those outer fringe bands, either early in the storm, or maybe you're on the periphery of the storm, you can be at risk for tornadoes. Uh, this produced the EF2 down there, um, and it can it produce enhanced areas of damage. I wanted to hammer this home. The reason why I'm showing Florence is because I think this is a, a really good graphic that captures that. The red arrow is Wrightsville Beach. That's what, where it made landfall. We had tornadoes up toward us, but more the western part of the Pamlico Sound. And then a couple of days later, you still have the circulation spinning up in the Richmond, Virginia. Well, well, well away from not only where the landfall occurred, uh, but for time-wise too, many, many days later. So as I wrap this up, we've made a lot of improvements on the track forecast. Please remember we mentioned the wobbles, the small changes that can make a huge difference. Please focus on the impacts, not just the category, and start to think about some of the indirect fatalities. And what we've noticed the last couple of years, we're starting to get more deaths on the back end of storms. So we've done really well with the messaging on the front end, uh, but with Hurricane Laura last year, seven deaths in the United States, which is pretty low for uh, magnitude uh, of that strength. 34, though, were indirect deaths, and that would be like uh, carbon monoxide. So 16 because of carbon monoxide. Uh, so historically, storm surge was the leading cause of fatalities, but in the last four years, we've lost more because of carbon monoxide poisoning. So you've got your generator, know how to use it, not to use it inside, and it seems like simple, simple things, but uh, that is a silent killer. So please, please think about your health and well-being after landfall. Um, safety, going up on ladders, um, just, you know, it's not over until it's over, and it's, you're three weeks beyond it, and, and we can focus on nice weather, hopefully, around the corner. Uh, this is just a graphic. To, this is, goes back to the 63-2012 graphic. Um, it is uh, eight times as many victims over the age of 60 as under uh, 21 years old. Uh, so it tends to be folks that are above 60 uh, for that.
So that is it. We're just over the hour mark, which is pretty good with all the information you got. That is my email. If you have any questions, um, this is our community, not just because we're down in Moorhead City. So if you ever need anything, that's the email.